I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit and that which we talk about classroom etiquette for our church. We, for those who are visiting with us on the internet, we encourage you to do the same thing. It's classroom etiquette. Uh, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, if you believe that, then you're saved. Jesus Christ died for, as a substitution for your sins and mine, was buried on third day, raised from the dead to give you eternal life. So this is a very important subject matter. Now that you're a believer, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit because of the church age, you are a believer priest and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You now have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit if there's personal sin in your life. You make confession of it according to 1 John 1, 9, not for salvation, but for sanctification. That is allowing the Holy Spirit to do his ministry in its appropriate venue. That is Bible study. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that's your personal sin, could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. You're to confess that silently through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us because of the work of Christ on the cross in regard to sin. It continually works, not for salvation, but for sanctification, so that the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth of the Word of God. It is the truth of the Word of God that sets you free from the cosmic lies of the, of the devil. So I give you a moment for that. Father, we're thankful today for this opportunity to once again, in the freedom of the, of the nation, to have the freedom of the pulpit to preach the truth of the Word of God in this church. I pray, Father, those who are in attendance both in the classroom and on the Internet would take seriously the conversation that comes from the Word of God and the discussion about it from the lips of Christ to the people of His time. And I pray, Father, that we would gain the message from it and the importance of that message to our personal life for our day of opportunity wherever we live to be that light to the world and the salt of the earth, uh, to, to build into our life the character of Christ that other people can witness, see, touch, and feel within our life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to John 6. <clears throat> when, we, when I last was with you, we've been looking at John 6. It is the longest chapter in the book of John. It's 71 verses. And we have been doing a special study in the book of John because in 21 chapters of John, half of that book is dedicated to a new teaching technique that Jesus introduced to the Jewish nation. Uh, it's called, Truly, Truly, I Say to You. And the uniqueness of his teaching technique was using the Old Covenant, Amen, which was normally placed at the end of a doxology, some great important doctrine that, that identified God and man's relationship with him. What he did is he doubled it up and put it on the front end of a message, not on the back side. When he doubled up the amen, it meant this. I want you to focus on two things before I teach you. I want you to focus on two things. The first amen would be from God because an amen had two parts to it. The first part is coming from God. It shall be so. The second part, and he put another amen in there, an amen always has a God part, the veracity of God. What I tell you is truth, believe it. There's always the veracity side of God, it shall be so. And there's the, there's the man side of it, that is the audience, the person that is hearing the word of God being taught. The other part of that, it, let it be so. So in the Old Testament, when they use the amen, they did at the end that said, God has spoken, you believe, and that is important. So they would say, it shall be so. And the congregation said, let it be so. 
What Jesus did, he's put it on the front side of it. He put it on the front side of it. And that is really important. That is really important. So when he says, for example, in our passage, in the, in the, in the Gospel of John, in the sixth chapter, in this, this whole chapter, he deals with four truly trulys. And he runs them in a series. Boom, boom, boom. And we showed you that last time I met with you. This is really important. The way he does that. When you look at, the, at this in the book of John, he, he has dealt with it truly, truly in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5, and now he's in chapter 6. And he's done four of them in chapter 6. Four of these truly, truly. He's laying out four doctrines that have a theme to them. There's two themes to the four truly, truly in John 6. And you will see this very clearly, hopefully, this morning. One is, the theme is, eternal life is the life of God that comes through the Son to a believer. Eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God that goes through the Son to a believer. That's the theme. The theme is eternal life to those who believe. Eternal life to those who believe. And he does it four times in the most unique way. He deals with my subject today, the bread out of heaven. Bread out of heaven. It didn't come because he was prepared to talk on that. He just became prepared to talk on he is the Messiah and what his purpose in life was. But when we read this passage today, verses 30 through 40, you will see that they quoted a scripture. Well, they actually quoted a reference to scripture. And from that reference, he went to check whether they had positive or negative attitude about the scripture and what they were saying. They brought up the subject of bread out of heaven. And boy, did he do a, a number with it. It shows you how important it is to be spiritually mature in the word of God and to be fast on your feet with the Lord. How, you, how unique it is to be able to think on your feet because you have the Holy Spirit that is ready to engage and be flexible be flexible. Go with what a person wants to hear it. Let him hear the gospel his way. You're going to learn that today. Be flexible. Don't have some road thing that the other person... Listen, find common ground to share the gospel with people. He does it today. He didn't come up with this bread out of heaven. They did. And he went, okay, I can work with that. And the whole chapter is about it. Now, you'll remember from our last time that this chapter deals with some famous things. For example, the feeding of the 5,000 is chapter 6. Another thing's important, walking on the water is in chapter 6. Chapter 6, 6, 6 is unique because you have a bunch of people leave the Lord. This is an important chapter. And in this chapter 6 are four great messianic doctrines that Jesus wants to teach. Out of the theme, the bread out of heaven that they come up with. So let's take a look at our text. We're looking at chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 30 through 40. This is where our second truly, truly is found. They said therefore to him, what then do you do for a sign, a miraculous sign, they're asking, that we may see and believe you? Now, listen, this is the same group. This is the same group that were seeking him after he fed them the five. These are the 5,000 plus. You suppose they've already seen a pretty good sign? That he, a miraculous sign? Huh? Five loaves and two fish?
I'll anyhow. Notice he asked two questions. They asked him two questions. What then do you do for a miraculous sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you what what work do you perform? They they give a a a scriptural reference. If you have a study Bible, you will see over in your footnotes that it comes from Exodus 16, and it's the manna story of the of the Exodus generation in the wilderness. They said, therefore, to him, uh, uh, they, they said then, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now, what they're referenced to is manna. It's, it's an Exodus 16. Jesus gives them a truly, truly. This is a great messianic truth he's about to lay on them. Okay, I could go with the bread out of heaven deal. I, go, I can go there. Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Now, you can see that they're thinking worldly, which means they're thinking squirrely, right? In verse 34, they said to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. They're talking like the woman at the well. If you knew about the water that I'm talking about, it would give you eternal life. And she goes like, whoa, I'll take that water because I won't have to come back and forth. It was not talking. But listen, the world thinks, listen, that's okay. The world thinks physical. They don't think spiritual. They think, but he's interested in their volition, whether it's positive or negative. All he's doing is trying to test them out. Jesus said to them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoa. They're talking about manna that comes from God. They're thinking physical because manna was a physical substance. It only had meaning to their life if they were spiritual, and then it was a spiritual bread because God provided it by grace, not by works. Come on now. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. The woman at the well had a thirst. They have a hunger. God, listen, Christ meets all of your needs. It is strange what brings people to Christ. It's out of human need that you are able to come to a place to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I came to Christ out of a human need. You came to Christ out of a human need in some regard. We all do. And it's only then that we realized it was a spiritual significant thing in my life. I've been born again. That's not what I thought of before I got saved. That was what I thought of after I got saved. I came, personally, I came to Christ out of a human need, out of a fear of dying and not knowing where I would go now that I've been told there's a heaven and a hell. I didn't know there's a heaven and a hell. Until I was told that, then it got in my head and I go like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If, that, that, if that's true, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Then when I found out it was a free pass, I was in. Because I kept thinking it was, they were going to charge me something and make me pay, you know. Nobody else gives you anything. If they do, watch out for your hip pocket. No free meals. That's the way I grew up. Well, anyhow, a human need. The woman at the well had a human need. 
Listen, they all have, everybody has human needs. And, and it's a strong thing. And it's whether or not God can satisfy, if God can do that. Can he reach my deepest need that's causing my life to go astray and, and uh, get out of control and do all this or whatever? So, but I said to you, listen, now watch this. Because he's going to nail volition. Do you know volition is the most important thing in salvation you can imagine? Will you believe or not? Listen to what he said. In verse 30, he said, I said to you that you have seen me that's horeo in the perfect tense. You know what the perfect tense means? You saw me do the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. You want me to perform a miracle? I've already done it. Not only did I feed you a little, I fed you till you needed to confess your sin. <laughs> yeah. I fed you full. I fed you till you were satisfied and there were leftovers. I didn't feed you. Oh, whoops. There's a, I found an extra piece of bread for you. I fed you a gourmet meal until you were satisfied. You want me to perform another one? And then another one, and another one. Listen, I did the first one so that you could believe that I am Christ. I am the anointed one. I am the Savior of the world. <laughs> so he says, I said to you that you have seen me, Horeo in the perfect tense, yet you do not believe. Ook plus pistuo plus the present active indicative, second person form. I showed you in the past with the result that you saw very clearly, and there was a buzz among you. Oh, my goodness. Philip, listen. This entire meal came out of a little bag of five little loaves, something like you would get at Olive Garden. You know that little loaf you get at the Olive Garden? It's really good doing it. That little loaf? That's what we're talking We're not talking about big loaf of bread. Probably something even smaller than that, probably half that size. Some in a little bag, a couple of little fish, like little sunfish, like I used to catch and take home. My mother said, We got the head off, we're going to eat the tail. I have said to you that you have seen me and do not believe. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly never cast out. How about that, Dale? You know who keeps you saved? The one who saves you. You don't keep your, He don't save you, then you keep yourself saved. That's not scriptural. That's not messianic. That's not what Jesus Christ is all about. That's what religion is about. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. Here's a verse for you. Grab that verse. This came from the mouth of Christ. For I have come down from heaven to do, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Look at verse 20, uh, 39. Look at that verse. And this is the will of him who sent me that of all that he has given me, I lose not one. You know, old John Hagee, I, that I got said, old Jewish converted Jew, got me saved. He gave me John 10, 28 through 30. You're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God. Nobody can pluck you. Nobody can twist his little finger and get you out. I said, I don't know what pluck is. He said, you're a farm boy. What do you mean you don't know what pluck means? I went, okay. I know what pluck means. No one can snatch him out of your hand. This is what, this is what he's saying. That's in John 10. I'm in John 6. When he says, never lose one. I will never lose one. Not one. You know why? 
Listen to me. Because the Father has decreed it, it's now the will of God. It has been decreed in eternity past that everybody that comes to the Son for salvation will have eternal life, will never, ever have nothing but that. It is decreed. When it's decreed, it is the will of the Father. Boy, you remember that one. That's why it is so important when God reveals His will to you, you take that stuff serious. And listen, when you get mature in your faith, He wants the details of the will of God to be taken seriously. We've seen that recently. Well, where else am I? Well, let's see. Verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son, like you guys have seen, he says, and believes in Him, may have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. I got him. I got him now and I got him forever. I got him on earth. I got him in heaven. I got him. I got him for now and forever. I got him. That's what he's saying. I got him now and I am at the resurrection. I got him. I got him whether they're living or dead. And in between, I got him. <laughs> I don't, you know, in between that dash on the tombstone. Four of them. What he's addressing is the seeking crowd from the feeding of the 5,000 that were engaged with him in the first truly, truly of John 6. This crowd has now become the sign crowd of the second truly, truly. They said to him, what then will you do for a sign? Here's Satan's little lie that our passage reveals. Here's the Satan's little lie. See how little it is? Look on your paper and say how little I... <laughs> I really work hard at this stuff. You don't realize it. Satan's little lie. You, here's his lie. You need to see to believe. There's his lie. You can hear it out of their mouth. That's Cosmos Diabolicus. You heard it right out of their own mouth. This is what I believe. I have to see to believe. There's a false religion. There's a bunch of Jews who don't know what they're talking about, even though they're quoting the Scripture. Here's the Lord's big truth. You need to believe to see. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by... There you go. So stop. listen, here's, my, here's mine to you. Stop doing it in your life. Because you know what sight does? It panics you. It spins your world upside down. That's what it does. It causes you to have anxiety. Faith doesn't. Put you at rest. You know why? Because God's in charge. If you really believe God's in charge of your life, it puts you at rest. It's called faith rest. It's based on a, a, a sabbatical idea. You know what it is? Grace. God's got it. And God will get, listen, I'm just going to let it, I'm just going to sit here, and when God returns it to me, it'll be better than I could imagine. Come on now. I'm not going to give you a spoiled piece of bread. He's not going to find something on the side of the road that's been roadkill. Oh, you're hungry. Well, let me think. Oh, 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 he's hungry. He's hungry. Oh, 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 well, there's something dead on the road. Well, get it and feed it. He not do that. We think he does that because we never buy into this idea that God's in control. That he's got it. I'm letting it pass through your life so that you will understand, I got it. I've got it. Do you, are you getting it? Because I got it. Are you getting it? I got it. Come on now. So, let me talk about three things before we take a break and have a cup of coffee and chat. 
Here are the three things, and here's what I want you to see. Out of the two questions that they asked Jesus, they gave him a scriptural reference, and he took it and ran. Right? Quick on his feet. Now, you know why he's quick on his feet? Oh, because he's the son of God. What are you? Son of God. Oh, well, oh, well but, 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 but he was a better son of God. No, 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 no. He wasn't a better son of God. He was the only begotten one, but he wasn't a better. He was begotten. In Christ, you're as secure as Christ could have ever been secured. You're in God. Come on now. So, I just ran through all of your, all the sign crowd, the scriptural reference. Remember, they didn't give a direct quote from uh, Exodus 16. They gave a reference or a principle, which is okay. We all do it, don't we? Somebody asks something, and we give them, a, we give them an idea about it, a principle about it, and a scripture. And listen, sometimes... Listen, this is a crowd that don't have a lot of information. But usually, we, we're able to go in there and give specifics, aren't we? But they gave a, a, a reference uh, to manna. They're still, they, they brought up the bread idea. They're still on the bread idea. So, and what he does is turn around and talk about where the source of it all comes from. The source of the bread is the source of the life of the world, Right? The bread out of heaven is the life to the world. And so he deals with the life. The source is eternal. The source is eternal life. He came down from heaven for those who would believe. The true bread of heaven is the bread of God. It's the bread of life to the world. Jesus said, here's our problem. I told you, I said to you that you have seen me clearly do miraculous signs. Yet you do not believe. How many signs do you have to see? Well, let me tell you. I know right now that they're going to have to go to at least 12 or 13. Because when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had 10 miraculous signs. It wasn't enough. So he gave them one at the Red Sea. That wasn't enough. So he gave them manna from heaven. And that wasn't enough because they all died in the wilderness by reversionism. They never brought into grace. Not one time. And he showed them over and over and over miraculous signs of God's grace. They never brought into it. These were a group of, of believers that never brought into grace. If they didn't see it, they didn't believe it. And even when they saw it, they didn't believe it. How about that? Let us not be those people. Let us not be these, let us not be these people. And so he brought, brings out to them the big gun. He brings out the big gun. He talks about the sovereign will of God. The sovereign will of God. If you believe in the sovereignty of God when he tells you I've got you secured, if you believe in my son that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you're secured. In Christ you can never be lost. In Christ you can never be lost. In Christ you can never be lost. Because he came to seek and to find the lost. And when he finds them, they're never lost ever again. Hoo-ah. Do we not have a message to tell to the world? Tell me, dear hearts. Do we not have a... Listen to verse 40. This is the will of my Father. Now get this. Here's the will of the Father to the world. You know, like 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. Remember that? Here's the will of the Father to the world. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son 
gets a good look. Jesus died for my sins and was buried and raised from the dead. And believes in Him has eternal life. And I myself, you know that word, I love this. The Greek, the Greek has a wonderful way of taking something personal. See the word everyone? I love the old King James. You know what the old King James did with, this is the, this is the phrase pasol, P-A-S-H-O. It's translated into English the best you can do it. The King James translated this, this phrase that goes with usually a participle or, or something. He, the, whosoever, like in John 16, whosoever believeth, no longer perish but has everlasting life. That's used a lot by John. And what it does, it brings salvation down into a single digit, an individual, makes it personal. Remember when Jesus went to the woman at the well? She was so proud at, at the well. This was Jacob's well. This is Jacob's well. Oh, give me a J, give me an A. Yeah, this is Jacob's well. This is where my religion is. Say, so you know anything about the background of that well? What? Do you know in the Bible where Jacob's well can be found? What? That's when people don't want to hear what you're saying. What? Do you know that what that well was about? It was about Jacob coming to understand Jehovah God or the Lord of God, the Lord God. It is the Lord God. It is the Lord. It is the Son of God. It is the second member of the Godhead that God has assigned to the human to have a personal relationship with God through the Son. It is through the Son of God. It is through the Messiah. It is through the Anointed One that God has sent from heaven for the individual in order to enter into an intimate, personal relationship with God that He's the Father and you're the child comes through the Son through faith. Do you know that? And do you know that he now becomes your daddy? He's not just your big father image. Not the guy who has the, the belt with him all the time. The guy who hugs you and kisses you and tells you how important you are to their life. What visions and what aspirations they have for you and your potential. That's your daddy. It's your daddy. <clears throat> Do you not know? <clears throat> and listen, before they were done at the well, she got it. She got it. That the way to the Father is through the Messiah. And for her, drinking was a symbol of non-meritorious work of God called grace to those who believe. That's what he's saying to the people here. They're using hunger. They're using hunger. Watch this at point number two. Did you notice that the sign crowd followed up two questions with a, 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 spiritual, a scriptural reference that resulted in the second truly, truly? And did you notice, and this is important, did you notice that the second truly, truly fed off the first question from their first truly, truly? 
Listen to verse 29, because it has everything to do with our passage, verses 30 through 40. What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered, This is the work of God that you believe in Him who sent you. Off from that, they tried to flip that thing, a manna. He took it, because it was a scriptural reference, and popped it back a different way. Still on the same subject. Did you miss that? Did you miss, what shall we do that we may work the work of God? He told them, this is the work of God that you believe. In other words, the work of God is based on faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God results in work. It first work that you get is the work of God through grace. When you believe the gospel, the grace saves you. When you leave the promises of God, the grace provides it. There are six stages to, to God's grace, saving, logistical, you know it. They all operate under the same principle. Hearing the Word of God, believing the Word of God, applying the Word of God, you know the faith drill, the cycle. If you don't, you should learn it. This is the work of God, faith. Isn't that interesting? Christianity is, is, listen, it's so polarized today. Listen, but, but it's good because it's a very clear work or grace camp. You don't take you long in either one of them to know which one you're in. You're in a grace camp here. This is the work of God that you believe. Paul taught that sight was a big stumbling block to faith, especially to the Jews. He said in 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jew asked for signs like empiricism. The Greek searched for wisdom like rationalism, and now you have very clearly the three systems of perception. You, that, and listen, empiricism is not wrong if it brings you to faith. Rationalism is not wrong if it brings you to faith. But listen, if it doesn't bring you to faith, it's an empty pursuit. These people were empiric. They wanted to see observation, observation, observation. I must observate. And he said, listen, you have behold, yet you don't believe. In other words, empiricism is supposed to lead you to faith. Rationalism is supposed to lead you to faith. They're not wrong in themselves except when they block faith. You do see that. The woman of the well had it. You had it. I had it. Who didn't have it? Listen, the end, the end is faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing it and believing the Word of God. It's really important that we understand these things. Very often, doctrinal points or principles are missed. Now watch this. Watch closely, my friends. Are missed because of rationalism or empiricism interference with faith. For example, this, this very Jewish science crowd used an important doctrinal principle and didn't even realize what was important. For example, they talked, they, they talked about he's, they talked about he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Do you know the most important part of that? To eat. To eat. What if you get the bread and don't believe? God sent the manna. Suppose you get the manna and don't believe. Well, I don't know what it is. Because they ask. Manna means what is it? It said it don't, be, don't matter. God said that you're hungry, I'm going to feed you. You got to eat to believe. And if you, listen to me, if you're hungry and don't believe, what happens to you? You starve. What if you get the bread and greed enters in 
and you keep it overnight, when God says, don't keep it, I give you daily bread. Suppose greed gets involved in it and you think you got to store it up because now you got extra, you better put something a little bit back for tomorrow. Come on, America! You don't listen to me at all. You've just shut your Bible up. What happened to it tomorrow? The manna, what happened tomorrow if you kept it? It rotted. It smelled worse than anything you could imagine. How could anything good smell so bad? You, you better than anybody ought to know that. You eat it today, and you know. As a church, are you getting this? Or are you staying out there with rationalism? Because let me tell you, God makes it very clear that we live on our daily bread. Are we right or wrong? I mean, why do you walk by faith every day? Why, why is it in the present tense? I, de, I, de, I make one walk and I walk forever. Only in your dreams. You see, eating was the key. Like for the woman at the well, it was drinking. It was meeting the human need, but how was it done? It's done by grace through faith. And that not of yourself. It's a gift. That's the way the principle always works, dear hearts. It's the way the principle always works. It always works. It always works. And listen. Don't spend your time listening to think there's another way. Jesus reminded these Bible-quoting Jews... <laughs> Hello now. Jesus reminded these Bible quoting Jews that the manna bread that came out of heaven was from God and not from Moses. I want you to write this down. John 5, maybe I wrote it down for you. Did I put on your paper? Yeah, John 5, 39 through 40. He says to him, You know, you study the Bible all the time. You search through the Bible, through the Bible, through the Bible for eternal life. And never find it. You know why? It's found in me, Jesus Christ. See what they had? See the problem they had? And, if they, and when they found him, he had to show signs after signs after signs after signs. He finally said, The biggest sign I'll give you, bunch of dummies, I will give you this one. Three days to three nights, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And listen, you bunch of dummies, listen. Three days and three nights, I'll be in the heart of the earth. And on the third day, I'll be out. I will be knocking on your door saying, Howdy do! I gave you sign after sign after sign. You want a sign? I gave you a sign. I gave you a sign. I had you all carrying signs. And it got us nowhere. This is the last sign I give this generation. Some of them were smart enough to believe. My last sign to this world. They challenged Jesus to prove that he was the true bread, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bread out of heaven. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. They're thinking physically. Listen, when, listen to me now. When Jesus takes care of your spiritual needs, He's got all your other needs done. It's rolled up, baby, and done. Ah, you don't believe it. <laughs> you don't. I know it. Listen, I can only tell it to you. I can't make you believe none of this stuff. You just go ahead and hold on to your purse till the wind blows it away. And then go into your panic. Oh, God! You might as well do it now! Now, I'm not going to give, I am in a moment going to give an offering call, but I'm not going to ask you to give your fur coat, your automobiles. But I am going to ask you to give your heart. I am going to ask you to give your heart. Give your whole heart. Not part of it, all of it. Some of you have never 
you've believed and never loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. You've never done it all because you have those moments of panic. Well, I mean, what would happen tomorrow if you lost everything? I'm talking about every, everything you've worked for all your life you lost. What would you do, Job? What would you do? And if that wasn't enough, he, he allowed you to be struck with the worst illnesses and sicknesses that could be on the face of the earth. What would you do, Job? Listen, face it straight up and head on before it gets there. Give your whole heart. Not just a little bit of it. Give your whole heart. Get wholeheartedly into something. Athletes that don't give their whole heart never, never, never wind up athletes. They just go through the motions. No coach likes to see somebody give them a little bit of effort. They want it all. Leave it on the field, son. Leave it on the field. I mean, this is a message about giving it all. Give it all. You're going to die and everybody's going to fight over it anyhow. The worst fights I've ever seen in my life was what was left. They'll fight over a napkin. Raise your kids to be independent, not to depend on you. You're not the bailout. God is. Provide them with everything that they can be self-sufficient. Leave them alone. Give them nothing. But what you can give them in time. Give them love. Whatever you're going to give them, give them now. Don't let them fight for anything. Let them fight for nothing. The smartest man I ever knew left his money in an estate for all the grandkids. And he had a set thing that they had to go through or else they lost it. And in the end, charity's got it. I'm going to help you get on your feet. I'm going to help you get on your feet. I'm going to help you while I'm alive. I'm going to help you and help you and train you and get you on your feet. I'm going to leave a little money to help you help your kids get all on their feet. To get a, get a start in life. And what they do with it's up to them. Father, we're so thankful today for your grace. We're thankful, Father, for all that you've provided us today through this story. I mean, how much of our heart will we give? Is, is it based on sight or faith? If it's on a faith, we have no worry about what we give to God. Listen, he don't want our possessions. He gave them to us to start with. He don't want them back. He, want them, he wants them used wisely. What he wants from us is our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole strength, our whole efforts of life, everything about life is what he wants. He wants to be the major player in our life. Oh, God, today, encourage our hearts for this. Encourage mine. Mine. Take this offering today, Father, and may we be good stewards of it. Reach the most we can going westward. Around the globe. Around the globe many times around the globe with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen.